All right, I want to welcome all of our campuses that are joining us. I want to welcome each week those that are joining us online as well to week two of our series entitled Winning Over Worry. Come on, let's just welcome all those that are joining us live. So excited to have you guys. We kicked off last week what I believe is a very important series for all of our lives. And it's, it's how to win over this thing, and I call it a thing called worry. Here's what I said last week. I said worry divides the mind. The biblical word for worry, we looked in the book of Matthew, it actually means to divide the mind. In other words, it's like on a train track, it's like having one engine going this way and another engine going that way. But we said that when we learn how to worship God and focus on God, it unites the mind. Worry can break down every part of our being. Now, some of you may think, well, that's not really a big deal, Pastor. I mean, worry is just, I mean, it's kind of just my little deal. I do it all right here. But the problem is, is that worry doesn't only divide the mind. It divides your emotions. It divides your perceptions. It divides your volitional capacity where you become what the Bible calls double-minded in your decisions. It's not some small thing. Now, here's the good news. The good news is, is that if we do it God's way, everybody say God's way. If we do it God's way, we can win over worry. We all have challenges. We all deal with challenges, whether it's health challenges, whether it's financial challenges relational challenges. Some of you guys are in marriage challenges right now. In all of these things, and even cultural challenges that we're all faced with. But when we worry, our perspective becomes skewed. In other words, we don't see things from God's perspective. And that's why it's so important we learn God's way of winning over worry. By the way, today I want to talk to you about what I believe is the antidote. Now, what is the antidote? Antidote is a, it's a medical term. And it it has to do with counteracting something. So, Pastor, what is the antidote? If there's one thing that you can boil down that is actually an antidote, something that directly counteracts worry. I want to talk to you today about how we can learn to harness this powerful emotion called gratitude. I want to talk to you about the power of a grateful heart. See, one of the things that I think happens when we focus on God, when we take our focus off of ourself, is there is a release of this powerful emotion called gratitude. I have a friend who, uh, he'll call me, and, and he'll just leave messages. And he calls me Brother Steve, which is fine. And uh, I know it's a biblical concept. And, and he, just, he just calls me, and he'll, he'll just leave this message on my phone. And he's always up. He's always excited. He's always just life-giving. Yeah, you ever been around somebody like that? You, you want to just kind of shake him and like, are you sure this is real? Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? He's like, always. And I, listen, I've known him for 25 years. He has never changed, ever. The reality is I know some of the things that he's gone through, though. And all of his circumstances have not been amazing. But he's made a choice. He's learned how to harness this powerful emotion of gratitude. See, I do believe that gratitude is an antidote that God gives us. Here it is, to counteract worry, to unite the mind, not to divide the mind. That's what worry does. But to unite the mind, to unite our emotional life, and yes, to to unite our soul, where we can make better decisions, we can make wiser decisions. We're not distracted, we're not torn apart. Pastor, gratitude. What is this whole thing about gratitude? See, I believe that God has designed us. Here it is, spirit. Everyone say spirit. Everybody say soul. And everybody say body. Well, our spiritual life, that's our heart. Before we come to God, that part of our being is, it's, it's turned off. It's dead, the Bible talks about. But our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And then we have a physical body. Now, God created us for our spiritual life, our emotional life, and our soul, and our physical life to all interact and interface together. In other words, God doesn't want us separating the two. And so God designed us where there are physiological responses that are healthy, that are powerful, that that feel good. 
Feelings aren't a bad thing. We're not led by feelings, but there's a release of, there's a release of good feelings when we make proper choices. And one of the feelings that God has given us physiologically, I'll even say it biologically, is this rush. Listen, it is a powerful feeling that comes as we demonstrate gratitude. I wrote this down. In our brain, being grateful and expressing an attitude of thanksgiving time after time releases a motivation a productivity and a sense of well-being unmatched with any other emotion. Listen to this. This emotion is experienced through the release of chemicals. Those of you that know medical science, and I've taught on this through burnout and breakdown and things that I've gone through, that there are neurotransmitters, endorphins in our brain, serotonin, oxytocin, and, and all these wonderful things, uh, endorphins that are released, happy feelings that come in our brain. And one of the ways they're released is demonstrating a consistent attitude of gratitude. Pastor, I never thought of it that way. Do you mean that, 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 that God has designed us in such a way that our spiritual life and our emotional life in our body, the emotional realm, the soul, how it's all connected when we choose, listen, when we choose a positive attitude, when we choose to be grateful to God, when we choose even in spite of our environment, something is released on the inside of you. God designed you that way. Sometimes we make it so complicated. Oh, you know, pastor, you know, it's my spiritual life. But, you know, this is my professional life. No, 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 tell me. I mean, you know, there isn't a separation. God's not just concerned of an hour and 10 minutes on Sunday. But God wants your, an integration of your spiritual life and, and, your, and your emotional life and your physical life. There's an integration. That's why I think it's so important that we learn how to harness this emotion of gratitude as an antidote to worry. Listen to this Princeton study reflecting on the positive past achievements that we accomplish allows our brain to relive an experience. This is a study that was done a number of years ago by Princeton University. And they evaluated people and they, they did a, a test over a, a number of years and they came to the conclusion that reflecting on past Positive achievements allows your brain to relive that experience. Now, here's what's amazing. Our brains have a hard time of telling the difference between what is real and what is imagined. In other words, what we're actually experiencing, what we're actually doing versus a memory. Think about this for a moment. The serotonin in our bodies that is produced was actually the same with those that were doing actual achievements versus those that were remembering past accomplishments. In other words, their mental picture of things that they had done and that they were grateful for doing them released the same chemical release that those that were actually in the process of doing them. Pastor, this is amazing. So, so in other words... When I pause in my life, some of you guys are going to get this for the first time because you're going to realize that God is very practical. You, that God designed you and I in a certain way. He put a DNA in us to, listen, for us to do certain things that trigger certain chemicals. So in other words, when I pause and I'm grateful and I allow the gratitude in my soul to rise up to God, it releases healthy chemicals in my brain, healthy endorphins in my brain. In other words, I begin to feel better whether or not I'm actually doing the thing or it's a memory of a past thing. In other words, in other words, there is power released in you spiritually, emotionally, and even physiologically when you're grateful. Wow. Never forget a number of years ago, I saw a motivational speaker. It's really powerful. And it was amazing. There was a, it was a room full of 2,000 women. And, and he was speaking to these ladies. And, and, and he was talking about in life and overcoming challenges. It was not Christian. I don't even know if he's a professing Christian at all. But it was a powerful exercise. And, and by the way, let me just say this. People that use the New Age movement or even just psychological techniques, whether or not they give God credit or not, we want, to know, we want you to understand that there are things in the Bible that people rip off. They don't give Jesus credit. But if you go to the Bible, many of these things are in there. Are you with me? 
For example, here's what he did. Towards the end of the message, I don't call it a sermon, but towards the end of the message, he had 2,000 ladies put their hand over their heart like this. And they had some music that started playing. And he brought them through an exercise. Watch this. It was called a gratitude exercise. And he brought them through an exercise. It was probably five or 10 minutes long. And his music was playing in the background. He brought them through experiences in their life. And he says, I want you to think about an experience that you're grateful for. Now, he didn't say grateful to Jesus. He just said that you're grateful for. Watch the tapping in. And he brought them through this. Guys, I gotta tell you what happened. After about five minutes, there was probably three or 400 ladies and the camera would kind of go close to the faces and you would see tears coming up. And then the next thing you saw is, is, is their, their, their countenance began to change. And there were smiles on their face. And, and, and so now I want you to think about this for a moment. All right, it wasn't the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't preaching Christ, but he was leading them through an exercise, teaching them to tap into their God nature in the sense of we're made in the image of God. And we're made with chemicals that are released, watch this, that are released through gratitude. And all of a sudden, there was this sense it was just sense. I got to be honest, man. I was just so overwhelmed by that. I thought to myself, wow, as Christians, as Christians, maybe that's why Paul said, rejoice always and always rejoice. Be grateful. How many times you see in the Bible, give thanks. Everybody say, give thanks. God has designed you. I want you to listen to me. God has designed you with a spirit. God has designed you with a soul. God has designed you with a body. And when we learn to harness this emotion of gratitude, listen, it is the antidote to worry. It unites the mind. James chapter one, verse 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights as believers our gratitude should overflow to God, but it should also overflow to those that have been gracious to us as well. Pastor, is having a bad attitude a sin? People have asked me this before. Is having a bad attitude sin? Here's how I'd respond to this. I can't necessarily say having a bad attitude is sin, although being grumpy and grouchy doesn't help anybody, but I will say this. If you don't learn how to check grumpiness and grouchiness, it'll definitely lead you to sin. Can I say it that way? I'm not necessarily suggesting that having a bad attitude is sin, but I will say this, that if we don't check it at the door, you ever heard that before? You better check that attitude at the door. Come on, that's a flashback to the 70s with your parents. Uh, if you don't check, you better check. If you don't check it at the door, I mean, it can lead you to sin. Ingratitude, grumbling, complaining, Pastor, what is an attitude? An attitude is a blending of your mental perceptions, your emotional responses, and your volitional capacities coming together. In other words, you choose to be grumpy. You choose to be grouchy. The power of that in our life, in the negative, but also in the positive. In other words, when somebody has a bad attitude, guess where their focus is? It's focused on self. When somebody is grateful, guess where their focus is? Their focus is on God. Now, let me tell you one of the problems that we all face. The problem is that we're all entitled. I mean, the fact is, is that I have an, I have an iPhone, and, uh, and, and I was, I just, this is a confession. We're in church. I got to get it out, all right? Giant cathartic session here. And so I had, I had a thing on my iPhone where I had to update my iPhone. You know what I'm talking about? Did y'all get that recently? And I'll be honest, I didn't want to put it down long enough to have to do that. I was just like, this is just aggravating. I don't want to do that. You know, I do it. and so I just, I kept just kind of pushing the button. No, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Why? Because I want full access 24 seven to my phone. I know that's a sickness, but that's where I am in my process. <laughs> Everybody say entitlement. And the problem is, is that, is that we've got these little things. By the way, I wrote them down. Two words of entitlement. I want it now and I deserve more. By the way, guys, do you know that I've told you this for years? My favorite food. Please, if I've been your pastor for a couple years, what is my favorite food? I'll tell you, say it. Mexican. Let me tell you why. Because when you go there, there's no wait. Put the chips on the table now. I'm not waiting 20 minutes. I want food. Ladies, let me help you. This is, this is how men are. We just want to feel full. Come on, guys. You know what I'm talking about. Give me the chips. Give it now. 
And don't you dare stop that sauce. Keep it rolling, keep it rolling, keep it rolling, keep it rolling. Everybody say, I want now. So that's entitlement, right? It's the opposite of the attitude of gratitude, or I deserve more. Nothing wrong with believing for more in life. The problem is, is that when you have an attitude of I deserve more, you can't be happy at point A because you're always desiring to be at point B. What I found is in the Lord's will is that when God will not bring us to point B until we can rejoice in point A. And by the way, let me tell you a group of people in the Bible that demonstrated this like no one else. It's the children of Israel. The children of Israel, you guys remember them? They were delivered from Egypt to Egyptian bondage. Talk about entitled people. They were there for 430 years in Egypt, all right? I mean, God came down, raised up Moses, delivered them from Egyptian bondage, brought them up to the Red Sea. I mean, just think about the miracles of God. Brought them up to the Red Sea. The waters pushed back. I'm talking about gratitude versus entitlement right now. God supernaturally pushed the water back. They crossed the, they, they crossed the Red Sea. Then the water boom, comes back, wipes out Pharaoh's army. They get into the wilderness. By the way, this is important for everybody to know at all of our campuses, it was only supposed to be an 11-day journey. Does anybody want to yell out loud how long it took for the children of Israel to get in the promised land? How many years? 40 years. It's a little bit longer than 11 days. But they went around the mountain and let me tell you the reason why. Because of their attitude. Murmuring, complaining, and grumbling. I want to give you guys, before we close that, I want to just give you three common things that I think that we can worry about, that we can grumble about, that we can murmur about. Three different things. And I think it's important for all of us to evaluate in our lives are we there? Do we possess this? Because here's the point. I don't want, listen, I don't want to live in worry regardless of my circumstances. I, I, I want to counteract that. I, I want to, Im- listen, I want to employ the antidote to worry. In other words, I want to be a grateful man. Grateful to God and grateful to the people around me. Number one, I want to talk to you about three common worries that we struggle with. The children of Israel demonstrated this. They complained about their provision. The children of Israel question God's provision. Numbers chapter 11 gives a clear picture of what God and Moses had to put up with while trying to lead them through the wilderness into the promised land. Numbers chapter 11, verse one. Watch this. Now remember, they're delivered from Egyptian bondage. They're high-fiving one another. God gave them all the gold and all this stuff. They come up to the Red Sea. God did a miracle. God brought them into the wilderness. 11-day journey. Watch this. Numbers chapter 11, verse one. This is amazing. Now when the people complained... It displeased the, Lord, displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. Not only did Moses have to listen to their complaints, but the Lord heard their griping as well. How many of you know that God hears our complaints? God hears our gripes. God hears our... <laughs> That's why David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, O God. In other words, Lord, I don't want to have a bad attitude, and I surely don't want you to hear about it. Psalms 139, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar. For there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. The children of Israel, they question God's provision. Think about it. Deliverance from Egypt. Deliverance through the Red Sea. God gave them all the provision. Go. Now, here's the problem. You guys ready? Here it is. Here it is. They're in the wilderness. Guess what they were having to eat every day? Manna. French bread. Not bad. Come on, are y'all with me? I mean, just, it's raining down from heaven. Man is raining down. And they get upset. Now remember, they're not farming, they're not tilling, they're not having, doing anything. And God is just supernaturally providing manna for them. Supernaturally. But they had a bad attitude about it. So here's what they began to do. Watch this. They began to curse God's provision. Question, question, listen to me. Are you cursing God's provision? You know, before we got into this building, of course, we've got campuses all over the place now, but before we got into the Little Creek campus, which is our broadcast campus, uh, before we got into this building six, seven years ago, we were in another building that was next to it. It's called the Annex. And the Annex was a, was, was a, was a skating rink. For those of you that are new to Church of the King at the, in the Manaville area, uh, at this Little Creek campus, the, the, the Annex next door was a skating rink. We renovated that thing. 
And, and I, it was a thousand seat auditorium. I was doing five services on a weekend, two on Saturday night, three on Sunday morning. And, um, and it was, it was, matter of fact, I had a big pastor come one time preaching and I was like, I had him come preach at the church and he came up to it and I said, man, what do you think about our church? He goes, man, it's great. It looks like a Kmart with a cross. I didn't know if that was a compliment or not. God, just to be honest, I, I, I'm just being honest. Okay. <laughs> I'm not being mean to Kmart, but and, and I'm not even sure if that's around. But so anyway, so, so, so I, behind the, behind the stage, I'm trying to act this out. Behind the stage, there was this little walkway. Remember, it was a skating rink. Okay, we were holy rollers. All right, I'm sorry. That was cheesy. <laughs> cheesy, cheesy, cheesy. All right, here we go. So watch this. So behind the stage was this little walkway. And it's like crickety, crickety. And because there was, we, we, we made a stage behind the sc- screens and all this stuff. And, and I, I remember, we, we, were in, we were building this building, which was the longest building project in the history of Christianity. <laughs> Y'all know that's true. And I remember we were building this building and um, we were probably three or four years into it and I was walking behind, watch this, I was walking behind the screen and I was walking on that crickety thing and this came out of my mouth. I was like, God, when are we gonna get out of this building and get into that nice building? And I remember hearing clearly from God, you better not curse my provision. Listen to me. What happens is we always want to go there, but here's what I found. Listen, don't miss this. God won't bring you there if you curse where you are today. They had so much manna. They were so upset about it. They had manna waffles, manna manana bread, (laughs) manna cotti. Come on, y'all work with me, Italian folk. Okay, that's just, I'm just so cheesy this morning, but. (laughs) Finally, their attitude began to turn around and God says, all right, I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you some quail. Now, I'm gonna say this, God is emotionally mature. How many of y'all believe that Jesus, I mean, God's emotionally, he doesn't, I mean, he he does he's the only one that doesn't need a counselor. (laughs) He's called the divine counselor. I'm gonna be talking about that in a couple of weeks, but he is funny. Numbers chapter 11, look what he says. You shall not eat one day. So he starts bringing in quail. You shall not eat one day or two days, five days. He goes, but I'm going to give you a whole month of quail. I'm going to give you so much quail, it's going to come out of your nostrils and uh, become, uh, I mean, he just said, I'm going to pour it on. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this to say they weren't going to get quail until they were happy with manna. Question, look at me. Everybody look at all the campuses. Are you cursing where you are today? If you curse where you are today, God can't bring you into the bright tomorrow. Embrace where you are. Embrace God's provision. Everybody say provision. Yeah. Number one, are we complaining about provision? Are you complaining about your job? I hate my job. I just wish I had a better job. How about rejoice that you have a job? Nothing wrong with believing for another job, but be grateful with where you are today while God is bringing you into a brighter tomorrow. Come on, do y'all receive that? Number two. Okay, so they complain. I'm talking about attitude. I'm talking about the antidote. The antidote. Remember, that's a medical term to counteract. So how do I counteract worry? Gratitude. Why? Worry divides the mind. Gratitude unites the mind. So we can have complaints of provision. Here's the second complaint. There's complaints of comparison. Watch this. The children of Israel question God's plan. The book of Numbers reveals another dangerous worry that can be buried in each one of us like a ticking time bomb. It's called jealousy. Numbers chapter 12, verse one. (sighs) Here it is. It's amazing. Deliverance from Egypt, deliverance through the Red Sea, supernatural manna, a quail festival. (laughs) Then Miriam, that's Moses' sister. You guys may have not known that. Moses' sister. Miriam and Aaron, that's Moses' brother. Now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Because the the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, it appeared as though they were just upset because he married these. But the deeper issue, we're about to see it right here. Look at verse 2. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Has he not spoken through us also? Uh Uh-oh. But guess who was listening? The Bible says, And the Lord heard it. Wow. 
Well, God, you know what? I, I just can't understand why my coworker, you know, they got promoted and look at me. I mean, I was working as hard as them. And, and, and then after all, wait, time out, time out, time out. Are we looking up or are we looking to our left and our right? Every time, listen, if you're a runner and you're running, you know what I found when you're running a race? And I used to run years ago. I mean, uh, and com competitively, here's what you find is that you're always slow down if you're looking this way and that way. Miriam and Aaron were, were blessed of God. What did they have to complain about? God had given them so much, and all of a sudden, here it is. God, are you, are you telling me that you're only going to speak through Moses? What about me? How many times, as a friend or a sibling, a relative, a brother, a sister, maybe they get a house, and you don't get the house that you wanted. Or maybe, maybe their kid hits the home run, and they're the... 30, they get a 5,000 on their ACT. You know, did you know my son got, he got it like a 10,000. And you feel like, what? and all of a sudden, watch this, we start comparing. We start comparing. Can I tell you what happens? Can I tell you what happens in my life? Every time I start looking this way and that way, I not only slow down on my race that God, by the way, my race, the God's race for my life is not your race. God's not going to judge you at the end. Well done. Like, wait, time out. You did pretty good running Steve's race. No, that's not how it works. Well done, thy good and what? Everybody say it. Faithful. Faithful what? Faithful to accomplish what God's called you to do. In other words, faithful to be and do. In other words, your race is against yourself and your own potential in God. Miriam and Aaron lost sight of the fact that God had blessed them and they couldn't rejoice with those that rejoice. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Galatians chapter five says, but if you bite and devour one another, look at them, look how blessed they are. What about them? And why do they have more than me? Time out, get your eyes off of your right and left. Look up and look forward. As a result of their worrying and grumbling and comparison, according to Numbers chapter 20, oh man, this is heavy. Miriam and Aaron never entered the promised land. I don't want that to be said about me. You know, I, as a pastor, so of course I'm a Christian. That's a good thing. As a pastor, step one. <laughs> but as a pastor, professionally, I'm in a ministry, clergy. That's, that's, that's my professional role. And so there's lots of pastors and leaders and different people in, the, in, the, in that clergy realm. And, and it's interesting, you know, pastors are competitive, and there's a, there's, a, there's a healthy sense of learning from one another, but then you cross the line where you're complaining about God and talking about and running down one another. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I, I decided a long time ago, a long time ago, and I really mean this before God, I keep this open before the Lord. That's why we bless other churches in our area, Bible preaching churches. I'm friends with the other pastors and, 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 and we honor them and we love them and, and because we believe that we're part of God's team. We're, we're, we are part of what God's doing in our region, wherever our campuses are, but, but we do believe we're part. And I never forget many years ago, I have, a, I have an older brother in the Lord, Chris Hodges, and Chris is six, seven years older than me. And so it's not too, too you know, not like a whole generation difference. And, and, and God's hand is just on Chris's life. He's a friend of mine, and I mean, he's just, I mean, they open a campus, and they start with 5,000 people. It's like, it's just 5,000 people. Where'd they come from? I don't know. They were waiting for Church of the Highlands to come. <laughs> I, and I really mean that. And I remember years ago making a decision in my heart, I'm going to rejoice. God's hand is upon Chris. I'm not going to do anything. To, I'm going to rejoice. And watch this. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to rejoice with them. I'm going to, whether it's the crumbs off the table, I just want to be a part of what God's doing. How many of y'all are grateful that we've learned how to do freedom ministries from Church of the Highlands and Pastor Chris Hodges, all those of you. We've had thousands. But here's the deal. Don't miss this. I want everybody to hear me at all the campuses. I don't know if the camera can get close. Watch this. I'm the only one that can steward my heart. The only one. And I'm the only one that really knows what's going on right here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful for Pastor Chris. I'm grateful for other pastors because his race is not my race. Your race is not my race. My race is my race before God. Miriam and Aaron missed it because they didn't look up. They looked to their left and to their right. Let me give you the third thing. Are y'all learning anything yet? 
All right, here we go. Remember this. Don't forget this. Worry divides the mind. All right? Gratitude unites the mind. So sometimes we can complain about our provision. Sometimes we can complain and we can compare. But then there's complaints of unbelief, just flat out unbelief. The children of Israel question God's promise. And Numbers chapter 13, we find the Hebrew people on the edge of their destiny. At the Lord's command, Moses chose 12 men to go spy out the promised land. Joshua and Caleb led the group across the Jordan River to see if the land was fertile and how hard it would be to conquer the land. They returned with a cluster of grapes so big that it took two people to carry it. They also returned with two different reports. The 12 tribes of Israel, right? There were 12 sons of Jacob, became the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 na- Are you with me? One nation, but 12 tribes. God chose one from each tribe. Caleb and Joshua were one. Here it is. So 12 went across the Jordan River. They went in there, they began to check out the promised land, and they came back to the people of God. Moses goes, all right, here we go, let's huddle up. Huddle up, everybody, huddle up. All right, what you got? What you guys got? All right, Joshua, Caleb, you go first. You guys go first. And here's what they said. We are well able, let us go up at once and take possession. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the other 10... Here's what they said. But we're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger. Same people, same challenges, by the way. Worry divides the mind. Gratitude unites the mind. We're not able to go up, for they're stronger than us, for for they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they'd spied out. The land through which they've gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. How could two people see one thing and ten see totally something different? Same land. There were giants there, verse 33. The descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in their sight. They said we were like grasshoppers in comparison. In other words, we were comparing ourselves with them, and we we saw ourselves as small. It doesn't matter that God is in control. It doesn't matter that he delivered us from Egypt. It doesn't matter that he supernaturally parted the Red Sea. It doesn't matter that he rained down supernatural French bread from heaven. It doesn't matter that supernaturally, supernaturally quail were blown into the tent, into the camp. It doesn't matter. Because those guys over there across the river, man, they're big. I don't think we can take them. Since when do we take things and accomplish things in our own strength? The, issues were, the issue was not, are the giants bigger than us? The issue is, is that giant bigger than God? Don't miss what I'm about to say. The reason why we see giants so big is because we're seeing them from our own perspective. We need to see giants from God's perspective. And the reason why we see things from our own perspective is because we're trying to pull off life on our own. Because we're worrying on our own. We're grumbling on our own. We have a bad attitude on our own. But when we look up, when we are, our minds are united, we have hearts of gratitude, we see our giants from God's perspective. God's perspective. You guys, you know what they did? It's sad to say that night they went to bed and the 10 tried to figure out a plan. They started talking against Moses and God and grumbling and complaining. How foolish. I know this sounds harsh, but those grumblers and complainers, they didn't get to go into their promised land. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I want to confess and get out any grumbling, complaining. I'm going to ask God to work on my attitude. But it really does come down to a choice. It comes down to a choice. If we look at our challenges right here, I'm not denying those challenges, but I'm denying the right for those challenges to dominate my life. If I'm looking this way, if I'm looking that way, where are my eyes? They're everywhere but up. But when I look up and I'm grateful, God, what you've done in my life, God, I'm so grateful for your hand upon my life. I mean, all they had to do, here's what they should have done. They should have stopped in the wilderness and put their hands on their chest, 
on their heart and begin to think about. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now. Just everybody stand. Please stay with me. I've got just a couple minutes more. I'm trying to give you a practical takeaway. You're going to teach us. I'm going to teach you this. If you take this with you, this will transform your life. By the way, spiritually, emotionally, and chemically in your body. This affects the chemicals in your body. What they should have done, what they should have done is stopped and put their hand on their heart. And they should have started thinking about, you guys remember when we were in Egypt? God delivered us. God delivered us. How many of y'all remember what it was like before you were a Christian? Anybody in here? Come on, raise your hand. I remember what it was like. I remember what it was like. Now, some of you guys were so holy, you were holy in your mother's womb. Okay, I know that. You came out shining like an angel. I came out fighting people. Okay. That's why when I, got, I had to get baptized twice. Hold that sucker under longer. But I, but I know some of y'all are just holier than me. And I get that. It's fine. But I'm your pastor. But anyway... Let me tell you what I do. Let me tell you what I do. I just pause sometimes and I remember. I remember what it was like before I was a Christian. I remember. I remember coming to my parents here. I remember coming home one night so drunk, out of my mind. My dad's here today. And he was talking to me. Dad, you remember that? Talking to me. He goes, you know, and I, I would tithe and give still to the Lord. And I wasn't a Christian at all. I, just, I'm like, I thought I'd just, you know, whatever. And he goes, Steve, don't go to hell tithing. Do you remember telling me that then? <laughs> I remember what it was like. I remember. Lord, I remember what it was like. But I remember how you delivered me at that Bible study. <sighs> Lord, I remember how scared I was in college and I wasn't sure how I was going to go through, and, and um, I, I, we didn't have all the money for me to go to Tulane at the time, and my parents helped me in the beginning, but I, Lord, I, but I remember when that scholarship came through. That wasn't because I was slick. That was supernatural, and Lord, you did that, and I graduated with no debt. You did that. You did that. You did that. You did that, God. I remember when you I remember when you opened the door for Next Generation Ministries and those kids and Lord, the supernatural thing. I remember when you brought Jennifer to me, Lord. And Lord, supernaturally, you put us together. Lord, I remember when Church of the King started and I didn't even feel qualified. I apologized for the first two years because I felt so young. I was young, God. But I look, I felt so embarrassed. I, I look and I, but Lord, you did it, God. You did it. Lord, I remember when I burned out in 2010 and I wanted to quit the ministry, not because of immorality, but because I was burned out. And I was 41 years old, but you stepped into my life. Yeah. Yeah. Those were dark, dark dark times but you stepped in Jesus and you healed me and you restored me and you gave me another chance yeah Ooh. yeah and Lord whatever I'm facing today it's nothing compared to what you can do it's nothing you got this God I'm grateful I'm grateful and I'm grateful to the people. I'm grateful to the people you use in my life, God. I'm grateful for the coaches and teachers. I'm grateful for Mr. Don Burtis. Mr. Don, look at me. Who was my neighbor <laughs> who prayed for me. He's 85 years old. I got stitches in my head. When I was at a meet, he brought me, got stitches. But he prayed for me. I'm grateful. He denies this, but I remember he spanked me when I was bad, when I was a teenager. <laughs> He denies it, but you're, you're, you're old, Mr. Don. You forgot. <laughs> Listen, he bought me my first deer rifle. Thank you, Mr. Don. 
tell people you're grateful to. Thank them this Thanksgiving. Thank God. Thank people. We Listen, we are where we are because of the grace of God and God using people in our lives and His grace. Come on. How many of y'all are grateful? <laughs> grateful. Grateful to God. So if you're having a bad day, we all have them. Just start being grateful. If you're in a wilderness, just start being grateful. Get a gratitude journal. One of our elders, Dr. Greg, called me last night. He said, Pastor, man, thank you. That was such a good message. He goes, Nancy and I, the girls, they've got the four kids. And, 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 and uh, so the girls have gratitude journals. I have, I have a thing I write down. Just write, I'm telling you, just start. Lord, I'm grateful for my health. Lord, I'm grateful. I was in my backyard. And I'm, Lord, I'm just grateful for this backyard. I live in a subdivision. I'm just, I'm just grateful that I've, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm standing up. Just start there, and all of a sudden, yeah, the presence of God, spirit, soul, and body. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward right now. Oh, I'm sorry if I got a little emotional, but, man, I'm just telling you, the Holy Spirit, it'll transform your life. The antidote to worry. Worry divides. Gratitude unites the mind. If you need prayer, we're here for you. If you do not know Jesus, we're here for you. We love you. I pray the blessing of God. Those that are traveling this week, please be safe. May the grace of God, traveling mercies. Let's be safe in all of our gatherings. We're blessing of God upon your lives. Please, before you eat a meal, stop with your family and say, what are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? Just say this. Say, Jesus. Just everybody say, Jesus, I am grateful for. And then you just fill in the blank. You just fill in the blank. Lord, bless your people as they go forth this day. And the grace of God be upon you. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We love you. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next weekend. God bless. Missy, another great message in this series as we talk about winning over worry. I know God really has been speaking to me in these messages, and honestly, I can't wait to see everything that God has for us as we continue this journey together because God's promise for you is you don't have to live with worry. You really can be more than a conqueror of that, and you can win over worry. You know, we also want to encourage you guys, if you haven't already, to complete our next steps before the end of the year. For more information and to register, you can go to churchofthekingcom slash next steps. We really do hope to see you there, especially trying to jump in before the end of the year. We just, we love you guys. We, we love being with you. Church is such a special time for us where we can, man, be together online and, and encourage one another. And as always, if you need anything this week, please reach out to us by emailing online at churchoftheking.com or you can call our office 985-727-7017. Have a great week.